Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for waiting. Those of you have been on for a few minutes. Hopefully, you've got a copy of our release note in front of you. If not, don't worry too much because I'll be going through lots of the detail in there. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the, 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 the main reason for the 3.2 um, upgrade uh, of ATG is for the market practice support. So, as I'm sure most of you are already aware, as of uh, last weekend in November, um, the production environment of ATG will upgrade to the version 3.2 of market practice, which introduces a number of features, um, some of which are quite minor, a couple of which are quite big, uh, and we'll cover those today, as well as a few other um, small bug fixes that we've, we've uh, introduced into this uh, release, uh, which some of you will be quite pleased about a couple of those, um, as well as a significant additional um, piece around conversions that we'll talk about um, towards the end of the session. So uh, the way we're going to run through this is um, we're going to run through the release note top to bottom. Um, I'm going to skip over a few and come back to those at the end where we're going to demonstrate in, in more detail. Um, but we'll get started at the very top. Um, unfortunately, our, our new style of release notes we've recognized don't have any um, uh, IDs on them for, for reasons that are probably my fault. Um, so there's no number, so I'm going to go through them in order so we try and keep track of where we are. So um, first item in the release. Oh, sorry, actually, just before I carry on, if anybody can't see our screen, you should, you should see uh, an ATG login screen now. Uh, if you can't see that, or if you've got any problems with audio or any other questions, please do send a, a message through to Beth, uh, and she can either make me slow down and, and respond to something or help you out with any technical problems you've got. So uh, very first item on the release note is about conversions. So as part of market practice, um, there is now uh, a change in the messaging to allow an acquiring party to instruct the seeding party as part of the portfolio transfer request to convert an asset from one share class to another before it is re-registered to them. Um, I'm going to skip over that because we've got a lot more to talk about and show you around conversions because um, we've gone much, much broader than that uh, within the system this time around. So we'll come back to that one. Um, but uh, we have got the full conversion market practice support within, within ATG. Um, second one on the list, um, adding BCE event numbers. Um, so I'm going to come back to this again. We're going to demonstrate the pension stuff separately in, in a bit. Um, but this is about just extending the details that are included under the BCE data that's exchanged as part of a pension transfer. Uh, and again, that's a market practice change um, specifically. Um, third one again, also market practice change. Um, <clears throat> this is where, um, so those of you who, who use us already will be aware, we, we introduced um, uh, JISA and CTF transfers into ATG um, about 18 months before market practice has done so. Um, and the way that we built that was the proposal that went into market practice, um, but it did have a couple of tweaks, um, and therefore this item here is just a, uh, essentially aligning our implementation with what everyone else will go live with come November this year from the other vendors. Um, and this in particular just includes uh, the extra um, estimated transfer value at the, um, at the kind of uh, wrapper level um, so that um, uh, it, it's basically consistent with the other wrapper types because they all include that, that estimated transfer value. Um, next one down um, is, is basically the same thing. Um, it's about us removing our um, JISA and CTF transfers from being a special ATG piece and being market practice. So. Um, to send one of these uh, JISA or CTF transfers using ATG before this November, you have to do it with an ATG customer and you have to have turned on what we call ATG extensions to say that you're using something beyond market practice messaging. Um, this is basically removing that ATG extension-ness uh, of uh, JISA and CTF. Um, the only other part of market practice that was um, around the kind of ISA world was, was LISA support. Um, those of you who follow the market practice group will know that the, the original LISA change that was proposed um, was proposed prior to HMRC really finalizing all their details. Uh, and unfortunately, as a group, we didn't really review it again uh, until some of us came to implement it quite recently and found that actually the implementation that the market practice has defined is, is, is lacking quite a few data items that many people have agreed that they would need um, to move forward with that now. Some parties and some vendors have gone ahead and built that LISA support for this November anyway. Um, we polled our clients that we knew supported LISAs, and they either weren't interested in supporting it this time or agreed that the, the, the level of support the market practice would give them this time around, missing all the data items it was, wasn't really viable for use. Um, and so to date, we haven't built LISA support. Um, however, we have been involved in putting forward the change request to 
change the version of market practice next time around, which I'll come on to later, uh, and once the market practice does support all of the necessary data items, we will, we will be build, building that license support, um, but it's not coming this November. But that shouldn't be a surprise to anybody who supports them, because hopefully we've spoken to you already. Um, the other thing about the market practice change here, so this is the next item down about account transfer technical changes. Um, so uh, obviously up until November the 27th, is it? 23rd. 23rd, there you go. That's my best here. Um, uh, we have to support two versions of market practice. We're supporting version 1.1, um, predominantly for fund managers, and we're supporting version uh, 3.0. Are we on now? Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, ACG will work out which type of counterparty you're talking to, which version they're using, and send appropriate messaging to those counterparties. Um, this November, everyone aligns to the single version 3.2 of market practice, so that, that capability to um, denote which market practice version a counterparty supports and sending appropriate messaging, um, that's being removed um, so that no longer do we have to specify that. But that one is something that we'll come on to later on, that's something that has an impact on, on uh, CSB imports and exports and potentially integration interfaces for people that deal with product providers, because that's an item on product providers. So we'll come to that in a bit more detail later on. Um, the other thing that's in here is that market practice has clarified um, that bank account numbers when being passed in messaging must be specified as eight digits. Um, and so uh, where some of you have seven digit account numbers, which fundamentally you can just prefix with a zero, um, we, we should have, again, contacted all of you that, that need to know about this, but we're mandating that bank account numbers are now eight digits within ATG. Yeah, that email's gone out today, so you would have received okay. an email today from our support team if you currently have seven-digit bank account numbers set up. Perfect. Uh, so next one on the list, again, still market practice, is around ring fence pension assets. Um, so again, I'm going to come back to this later and demonstrate the pension stuff in, in one go. Um, but this is all about uh, the ability that if you um, hold assets uh, in, in ring, fence, uh, ring fence tranches, um, that uh, you have the ability to uh, exchange that information with a counterparty when performing a transfer, so that if you want to, you can um, take a, a pension across in a transfer and, and retain that ring fencing um, as per the client's requirement. Um, so I'll come back to that later. Um, next one is again a market practice change. Um, these two are really, well, one of them is, is important for one or two of our customers, but pretty much irrelevant to everybody else. Um, this is the inclusion of book costs on the, um, on the transfer in instruction messages that get sent to a custodian. So um, not many people's custodians care about that, but where yours do, and we know that a couple of you do, um, that information is now passed automatically downstream from you to your custodian if you have that book cost information um, to allow the custodian to store that on your behalf. Uh, and the second item in here um, is uh, very much a technical technical change. It was just something that was tidied up in market practice about what, what data items we include uh, in the messaging, albeit it might be useful for certain kind of um, reconciliation uh, information for, for, for cases in the IUH uh, and, and, or custodian marketplace. Um, next one on the list. Uh, so that lot was the, was, was the extent of the market practice changes. So um, it might not sound like a long list, but I can assure you it's a hell of a lot of work. Um, but uh, the next one, though, electronic conversions, is, is very much an extension of what we built for version 3.2. Now, Before you go on to the next thing, um, sure. I've just had an email from somebody saying they've lost sound. Um, oh. Is I suppose if anybody is going to say if anybody can't hear us, could they let us know? But um, could somebody just send us a question or a comment to let us know that they can hear us? Yeah, so, okay. Uh, thank you for those who can. <laughs> uh, hopefully it's more than three, but that's, uh, that's good. Yeah, brilliant. Lovely. Lots yeah. of people in here. That's <laughs> thank you. Hopefully that's a, an external problem. Um, so, yeah, so we, we've built um, with the FCA platform paper uh, and lots of things in the marketplace going on around conversions, um, we decided that it was probably a uh, necessity to build more conversion capability than market practice um, had dictated. Um, I'm not going to go through it all right here and now. I'm going to demonstrate all of the conversion capability later on. Um, but uh, what we're talking about in here is support for the uh, updated, so, so myself and, and, and Ben Cox um, uh, work with a number of other guys in the, in the kind of UK FMPG uh, group to
to look at the conversions market practice that was pulled together back in whenever it was, 2000 something, 11, 12, 13, 16, can't remember, um, and bring it up up to and in line with the kind of the way we're doing the standards today in the transfer space. Uh, and there is now an electronic conversions standard available for people to send electronic conversion instructions to fund managers. Um, and we have built that and utilized that for a number of other conversions features within ATG, which I'll explain later. Um, next one on the list is about manual override splits. This first one, I'm actually going to show you something, although it's not very exciting. Um, so this one's quite quite a contentious one. Um, a number of you will have had emails about this, this piece in the past. So within ATG, there is uh, a concept of uh, manual override. So this is a security role that's required when, uh, let's say, a counterparty's had a technical problem, they haven't been able to send you a message, um, and you need to complete a case on your side of the fence. This manual override role exists that allows you to basically perform a manual operation where we would otherwise expect something automatic or electronic to happen in, in its place. Now, unfortunately, because there are people in the marketplace that don't always abide by the market practice and don't always send all, all types of messages that they should, um, people have quite extensively turned on that manual override role, um, which has led to, well, firstly, they've needed to to be able to complete cases that are electronic uh, in, in nature. But unfortunately, it's led to a lot of operations teams misusing their, their, their rights they've been granted by having this role and manually performing operations before the system has been able to send electronic messages, breaking the whole chain and preventing other people from getting the messages that they required, causing them to turn on manual override and then just exacerbating the problem. Now, what we've tried to do um, with this is separate the role um, so that we built it into uh, two, two parts, essentially. Uh, if I remember what my login details are. So, no, I got it wrong. That's a good question, good point, I'll do it from there. Um, so, <clears throat> we used to have this, this single manual override role. No, it won't be. <laughs> Bear with us while I try and log in. What's this? Yes. Three. Three, three, three. Oh, three, three. Ten. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> so uh, we used to just have a manual override role. We've now got, um, sorry, down in ATG. Um, we've now got uh, a manual receiver override, a manual sender override, uh, and a create manual transfer override. Now. The idea here is that uh, the manual receiver override role allows people that are expecting to receive a message to perform a manual step if they don't think they're going to receive a message because the counterparty has told them they can't send it for some reason. That is the role that was the original manual override role. So if you've got manual override set up in the system, your users will still have access to this role. Um, and that's intentional because that's, that's the side of the role that we think is, is sensible and viable for staff to have access to. It is very, very rare that you should need a manual sender override role. This is where we're saying, um, I can't for some reason send the message electronically, so I'm going to pretend that I've sent it by manually overriding that electronic step. As I say, that should only ever really be used in error scenarios and probably only in conjunction with talking to our support desk and they advise you to do so. So nobody will have this role by default when, when you get your, your system. Um, and uh, we would recommend you don't give it to people typically. So this receiver role is the one that, that um, we think is reasonable for you to have. And if you've already got the manual override role set up, your users will continue to, to have this same role. Um, the create manual transfer override, I'm gonna let Beth describe because she knows it better than I do. Um, so this is uh, to be used in the scenario where you want to create a transfer out for a party that is marked as electronic within your system. So for whatever reason, you're doing the wrapper manually but you want to be able to create the transfer out your side to be able to process all the assets electronically so if you want to do that scenario you have to be able to have that role for electronic providers to be able to be displayed in the list when you're adding a manual transfer out yeah good um, and hopefully with these roles set up as they are now those of you who are used to not receiving messages from counterparties because they're ops guys have manually marked things as sent that were electronic um, hopefully a lot of the problems that's causing will go away. So that should be quite a good a good change. 
Right, the next one on the list, uh, XJS Upgrade. So um, we use uh, a JavaScript framework for our, our user interface called uh, XJS from Censure. Um, it's a very comprehensive library that gives us all the kind of things like these sort of tree views we can see here and the various grid controls and so on that we build our user interface uh, from. Um, now obviously as browser versions uh, upgrade and, and new versions of IE and Chrome and Firefox and so on come along and, and as new technologies um, uh, are released, um, we need to have uh, new versions of support um, for these things and uh, we obviously therefore have to keep these libraries that we use from third parties up to date. Um, that's what this one here is. It's upgrading to the latest version. Well, not, not actually now. There's now another version out, but um, a version of X, uh, X6. Um, and theoretically, there should be no change for you guys. Um, and obviously, we do extensive testing. However, different browser environments and so on, uh, it could be that we've missed something. So if you find anything peculiar in your, in your user interface, do let us know, and it may well be that it's, it's a cause of that. Um, but uh, hopefully you see absolutely no, no change or difference in the way the user interface works or behaves or appears. So next one on the list, uh, this one's quite a key one. So back across to ATG config. Um, this is um, the ability to mark a specific funds manual. Um, now, there's a number of you that will, will suffer from this problem. So at the moment in ATG, if we go to config, um, you have the ability to obviously set up um, funds under your fund managers. Um, if I go to uh, under my Lion Trust funds here, um, Lion Trust is set up as a fund manager to be an electronic party in the system. Uh, and so ATG by default and, and in the version of the system you guys are using in production today, every time it encounters a Lion Trust fund, it will decide that it should send re-registration instructions to the fund manager electronically. Um, now, we're all aware of certain fund managers having certain funds that they won't support electronically. I won't name names. Um, but it causes a problem because the system will automatically try and send those electronically to the fund manager. So we've now introduced this option so that um, you need to send this column on. It's not on by default in, in your views, but um, you've now got this ability to mark a particular fund as manual, um, meaning even though the fund manager is electronic, we can't do this electronically, so we need to send it on paper. So if we go across, best pre-prepared as a case, um, so go to our account transfers, uh, and go to our manual fund case here. Um, we've got a transfer out case here uh, that's ready to go. So if I release this case, this Lion Trust Asia Income Fund, that was the one we said was a manual fund, even though Lion Trust are electronic. So when we release it, give that a second to refresh. And where it's released, it would normally go to, to sent because it would send the electronic message and go green. It's now got a, uh, uh, a hand telling us that the fund doesn't support electronic messaging and therefore you guys would then be back into your normal stock transfer form generation process uh, as you would with, uh, with any other manual fund manager. Um, so another one that I think is gonna hopefully solve quite a few problems for people. Right, uh, next one on the list. We, before I carry on, have we got any questions or anything, Beth Carp, anyone? Unfortunately, I've lost the questions window, but I don't think so. Right, thank you. Uh, use chat for now, then, if Beth's lost the question window. Um, so, uh, next one on the list is the uh, is around configuration, it's around security data exports and APIs. So, um, we're increasingly getting requests from clients for means to extract um, detail about um, users, groups, security roles, permissions, you know, what, what 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 permissions or what access rights does an administrator have, etc., so that people can do security audits? It, it's it's you know it's become, I think it's probably the the next top topic after GDPR for us to be dealing with with with, with yourselves. Um, and in reaction to that, um, I think the, the the thing to say here is you know again ATG it's not a reporting system, so it it can't produce reports in exactly the format that everyone wants for um, for their specific systems they do these audits within. But what we have done is produce uh, a full set of, of, of exports and web services that you can use to extract the data from the system. Um, so for example, I think we've got a couple set up in AMS here. Um, so under the exports in AMS, you do need to talk to us about turning these things on. They're not all on by default. So uh, if you need any of these things, then, then give support a shout. But we've got a couple set up in here, for example, around security roles, you know, which users or groups have got access to security roles. 
So the, the, the full set of things that you've got availability for now is users, groups, departments, group members, department members, security roles, security role members, and security restrictions, which are the two you can see here, the event security roles and the UI function security roles. Uh, and that's all available via export here, um, as well as via web services um, for you to automate into systems if you so wish. Um, so as I say, um, uh, in fact, that covers the, um, the next item in, in the release note as well. That's the web service one. The first one was the exports. The second one was the web services. Um, so yeah, let us know if, if you need any of that. For those of you who we've already built custom exports for, um, there's no reason for you to, to change to these unless you want to. Um, but obviously these are uh, uh, kind of available for, for anything that you, you might need above and beyond what you've got. And for those of you who haven't done this yet, if you need to. Um, just going back to the manual funds one, we did just have a question through about okay. this one saying, um, I think it's just more of a, assuming we can then obtain the MI from HD on manual funds. Um, so I'm assuming that means, yeah, so when you've got a fund which is then marked as manual, it will flag up in the UI with the little hand icon that you're used to seeing. So then you'll be able to know that, yeah, you'll have to send a stock transfer form or whatever for those cases. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, uh, to, to, to your question, Jesse, well, I mean, you can unmute Jesse if you want yeah. to, um, to let us speak. But, um, so the, the, the fact that it's a manual fund within a transfer is, is no different to, to if it was a manual fund manager. Um, so, uh, I think Beth's trying to unmute you so you can speak to us, but I think she's failing. Yeah, you should now be able to talk, Jesse, if you've got a question. Or you can't hear us, or we scared you off. <laughs> or you're on mute. No, okay, we'll leave it there. We can always ask you then. I mean, the, the, the bottom line is to say that, that um, when, a, when a fund is marked as manual, all it does is, is make the transfer asset become manual in the same way as a manual fund manager would. So um, it, it, is, it is discovered and reported on and exported in exactly the same way as, as, um, a, as any other manual fund in that it, it becomes, uh, it has a manual reason uh, and it's marking, it's marked as needs attention and so forth. So um, it, um, it should work in exactly the same way. It shouldn't be any different. Right, uh, next one on the list is the, um, the, the addition of account numbers on drawdown tranches, um, which I'll come back to when I show the pensions piece again, uh, and I'll explain what that one's about when we get there. Um, right, next one, uh, showing the transfer timestamp on the transfer assets grid. So this one is quite key for some of you. So if we go across to our transfer assets screen. <clears throat> okay, so uh, you can see here, if we look at these two bottom rows here, so one of the bits of feedback that we had is that um, this confirmed timestamp that we have here um, in ATG is the time at which ATG applies the confirmation we receive from the fund manager, or indeed when a user manually types in a confirmation into ATG. It is not um, the timestamp at which the fund manager performed the re-registration. That is the, the transfer timestamp. Now, one of the bits of feedback that we had from people was that sometimes these confirmations arrive later and potentially on a different date to the date that the transfer timestamp was um, that the fund manager actually provided in the re-registration. And as much as this detail um, was, was tucked away in the system, it's not front and center in these grids. And also people using this for exports in some cases and using this to drive updates onto their systems. And people were therefore keying in the, the, the transfer date as being the confirmed timestamp in ATG, which might differ, as you can see here, to the actual timestamp that the fund manager did the re-registration on. Um, so we've added this column here. Again, it will be off by default, I imagine. Um, but you can turn on this transfer timestamp, and that is the actual re-reg timestamp that the fund manager provided, and that's the date you should be using for confirmations within your systems. Okie dokie. Uh, right, the next Four on the list are BAX transfer related, so the BAX validation, multi-select, the viewing of pen dates, and the BAX URN. Again, I'm going to show those in a minute. I'm going to show all the BAX stuff together. There's another couple at the end of the release notes. So I'll come back to those. Um, so I'm going to skip down to the first one on, on uh, the last enhancement on notifications uh, about closing failed notifications. So um, uh, if we look at, um, I don't think I've got any to show, but um, on the notification monitor, um, 
one of the bits of feedback that we've had from you uh, is that, so if you have notifications, we have, with this demo system, we haven't got any set up, but if you have notifications, all your completed notifications will sit in this bottom grid. Those of which that are still pending, um, but also failed notifications will sit in this top grid. The problem with the failed notifications is they sit there with a red traffic light and they build up over time. And until this release, there was no way of marking those as dealt with. So uh, with other failure cases in things like transfers and so on, if something gets rejected, say, you can, you can then close that rejected case um, to take it from a red traffic light to a gray traffic light, um, such that you know you've dealt with it and you can close it off and filter them out. Um, we hadn't added that ability for notifications, which meant that these, these were becoming quite unwieldy, these grids, and it was difficult to see what you hadn't hadn't dealt with. Um, so there is now, as you can see here, an option to close a failed notification if you don't want to try and retry it or if, if it's never going to go through. So you can tidy those up, they'll go gray, and you can filter them out. That's that one. Uh, then we're into the defect list. Um, so the first one there, um, clearing the filters when a save filter is applied. Um, this one, if you understand what I'm talking about, you'll be very pleased this is here. And if you don't, then I wouldn't worry about it. Um, but fundamentally, where you can create stored filters um, to you know, go and show you my rejected cases from yesterday or all transfer outs or whatever it is, um, there was a, a defect in the system such that when you applied a new filter um, from your saved filters, it wasn't always clearing out all of the other filters. Uh, and therefore, you were getting some strange results sometimes where you were getting things in your list that shouldn't apply to the filter that you were providing, or indeed sometimes no records at all when you were expecting some because there was a filter there that wasn't what you were expecting it to be. Um, so we found the problem in that, we fixed that, and now your filter should all work as expected. Um, the next one, um, again, I won't go into the detail on this one, it's quite a convoluted technical one, but um, Within AMS, you can set a password reuse limit. So this is the number of times that a user can specify the same password, uh, or sorry, the number of times they aren't allowed to specify the same password before they can reuse one. Um, this is a regression bug that came in. Um, I'm not, I can't remember which, which version it was, but, um, but the client spotted that this wasn't behaving as expected, um, and we've rectified that. So now that reuse limit is now reinstated properly so that users can't use their password again for n number of times. Um, next one down, uh, the uh, ATI rejection restrictions. Um, so basically, <clears throat> when we introduced the BACS capability, um, we allowed some new, we allowed some of the operations to be performed on BACS cases where you wouldn't be allowed to, uh, able to perform them in a non-BACS case, but we didn't tighten up the logic enough so that they were sometimes available in non-BACS cases. So all this change is doing is basically removing some of the options that should never have been there for normal transfer cases that came in as of as of the batch release because we didn't um, we didn't restrict some of those new options correctly. Um, next one down. So this one um, again, this is quite convoluted. So if, if you're if you're aware of it, um, you'll be pleased. And if you don't know about it, I wouldn't worry about trying to understand it. Um, but fundamentally, this is where. Um, if you had an unrecognized asset arrive in an information request, um, and then you uh, marked that asset as then supported, but it wasn't marked as supported within your account type. Um, so, so let's say we said uh, that we generally support Crest assets, but we don't support Crest assets within our SIP. Um, if we then discovered a Crest asset that was, that was unrecognized, it would be unrecognized within the case. But if we then through config marked it as a supported asset, irrespective of the fact that we said that Crest wasn't supported within a SIP, it was marking it for in specie because it was only looking at the asset level support and not whether or not it was supported within the account type as well. Um, so quite a detailed one, but we fixed that bug and those of you who have encountered that will, will not see it anymore. Um, the next one down, uh, the last one before we get into the back stuff again, um, the supporting partial and cached assets. So this was essentially a, a bit of an ambiguity, not that we hadn't made a mistake anyway because we were inconsistent with our own approach on this, but the market practice wasn't particularly clear um, about encached uh, assets, sorry, partial support um, for encached assets or, or indeed whether you could even have the concept of a partial transfer of an encached asset. Um, and we agreed under the, under the market practice group that, that we would and we should, um, and we have therefore 
uh, changed ATG to support both sending uh, a partial and cashed asset and receiving a partial and cashed, and cashed asset request because um, we did support one and not the other in the original version, so we were very confused. Um, but you now have the ability to, to support fully uh, and partially in caching an asset if you wish. Right, and then the bottom two are batch transfer items again, um, and therefore I'm not going to look at those because I'm going to go back to pensions. So we've got three issues to talk back through about pensions. Then we'll go for the back stuff, and then we'll get properly stuck into conversions and go through all the conversion support and capability we've got. So I'm going right back up to the start of the list. Um, you don't need to follow me necessarily because I'm talking through, but the second item on the list is all about adding BC event numbers. Uh, and so I think I can look at two cases here. So first of all, here's a, here's a SIP transfer case. Um, we've got uh, a couple of, um, so this is a case that, that's, that's virtually ready to finish. Um, we just need to send a complete. This is the point at which we'd be adding our BCE data. And we can see now, so before we used to have uh, within the BCE, within market practice, the ability to pass the event date, uh, the crystallization amount, and the percentage uh, of LTA used. Um, the gap that we always had was that we didn't ever actually include the type of uh, event that occurred. So we can see those are now displayed in the tree here. If we look at the details, um, you can see uh, those in the screens there. And in fact, if we go across this, uh, this other pension case here, which is um, not that one, sorry, where's the one? Oh, that's all I've got for this one, isn't it, Beth? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. You um, can add a new one. I can add a new one, that's what I was going to do, yeah. I knew I was going to show the list. So if we go into the ad screen here, we can see we've got the, the full list of the uh, HMRC recognized uh, benefit crystallization events and the text as defined under the market practice uh, that was all agreed painstakingly a few months ago. Um, so for those of you who don't do pensions, ignore that. For those of you who understand SIPs and so forth and, and, the, and the benefit crystallization stuff, that hopefully will make sense to you. Um, and, and the way this works, obviously, is if you, you pick one of these and it will pre-populate the text for you. You don't need to type anything in. Um, that will always pre-populate. Uh, and similarly, when you receive those from counterparties, they will populate into the into the tree and the details in the same way. Um, so that's the BCE change. That's quite straightforward. Next one on the list is one, two, three, four down from there, which is about ring fence pension assets. So uh, this one is all about, um, again, if you're not doing pensions, apologies, just hold tight. We'll only be a couple of minutes. Um, but this one is all about that ability to state. Uh, so in this case here, for example, this pension, we've got these three funds. Um, <clears throat> we've said we're partially in drawdown, so we know we've got some uncrystallized assets as well. So the idea here is to allow us the ability to say, okay, for each of these assets, um, uh, if they're ring fenced, which they are in this case, which we see if we go into the detail screen on here, um, which assets are held within, within which pots of our money. So we've got some drawdown here and we've also got some uncrystallized assets. So um, first of all, I just show you how you can see this um, sneak peek of conversions that we'll come back to later. Um, so here we can see we've got uh, a thousand units of this UK equity fund, and we can see that that's in a crystallized pot um, and it's a thousand units. So the whole of that, that fund is within a crystallized pot. In this particular case, um, we've only got one crystallized pot in this, in this drawdown tranche here. So we know it, it relates to that tranche. If indeed we have multiple tranches, you have to provide a tranche identifier on both your, um, your ring fenced crystallized uh, holding as well as on your drawdown tranche to make these all line up. And if you don't, the system won't let you uh, release or approve your data. Um, and again, similarly, if we go through some of these other ones, uh, we'll see that, uh, again, so that one's wholly in the uncrystallized pots. Uh, and this last one, I think, is a split across the two. Um, so this is supported under market practice, both at the, or oh, sorry, required, um, so if you state that the pension uh, uh, has ring-fenced ring assets within it um, at the information request phase and at the point that you confirm your portfolio transfer, you have to provide this ring-fencing data. The system won't allow you to specify ring-fenced holdings that don't add up to the total holding. Uh, and it won't allow you to reference, um, uh, if you've said you're fully in drawdown, it won't let you put an uncrystallized and so on and so forth. So it will, will guide you to do the right thing. This is all obviously supported via CSV imports and integration as well, for those of you who want to do that sort of thing, um, or it's all fully supported through the UI. And just to give you a flavor of that, if we go across this information request we've got set up here, this one we've set up as being uh, uh, ring-fenced. Um, and uh, I thought I was going to add another one in here, but you've already got one. Anyway, we could add another asset in here, let's say. Um, 
So if we stick in another Altus fund and say it's got 500 units, um, if I was to come under here, so first of all, if I was trying to try and, uh, uh, and release this case now, it wouldn't let me saying I've not provided ring fence asset holdings for this particular asset. Um, and similarly, if I come in here and say, okay, um, I've got 300 of those, or sorry, 300, uh, it wouldn't let me do that either, by the way. And they're in my uncrystallized pot, that'll put in a holding. And again, if I tried to release at that point, it would tell me I've not got enough and I'd have to put in the rest in, into a crystallized pot state. Um, that's kind of it, really, for, for, for that ring fence data. I mean, it, it's, it's a horrifically complicated change under the covers, but talking it through there it looks quite simple, really. So I don't know what all the fuss was about. Um, but obviously, those of you who are doing are doing SIP transfers and, and, and have ring fencing in place, um, feel free to, to talk to us about how we set that up and, and, and uh, do any integration and so forth you've got, uh, or if there's any anything that's unclear on that or you want any guidance on how to use it. Um, the last item then is uh, if we flip over the page, um, or over my page at least, um, the, this is an enhancement for account transfers about adding uh, an account number on drawdown tranches. So um, this was a request that uh, one of the clients uh, asked us for, which is where if you operate a system whereby each of your drawdown tranches is actually an account on your platform, um, it would be useful to be able to identify which account each drawdown tranche related to. Um, so, uh, not here, which case am I doing, Beth? You can go to the transfer in. Uh, I can't on see it, where is it? Platform two. I'm on the wrong account, I apologize, yeah, thank sorry. you. So, yeah, so the other side of the fence. <clears throat> so over here I've got my SIP transfer. So this has been confirmed, we've now had our drawdown data uh, arrive here. Um, as the acquiring party, I now have the ability to edit this, fire integration, etc., but also via the UI, and say, well, that's, that's account number blah on my system. So that can aid with integration or, or manual user updates to understand which drawdown pot has been set up on the platform and which account. Um, so that, uh, A, you can set up the, uh, the drawdown information correctly, but also, again, if there was ring fencing, it would allow you to understand which, which proportions of which assets go into which accounts. So quite a simple change, but hopefully quite useful to some of you. Um, for pensions, that, that's kind of it. Um, so uh, we'll move on to backs. So we're towards the end of the uh, list of enhancements there now. So the first one being backs validation. Um, so I'm not going to show anything for this one. I'm just going to describe what we've done here. So the back stuff went in last year. It's being used very extensively now by a number of you uh, with an, an, a load more testing, I believe, this October and more lined up for next February. Um, so it's going very well. Um, it has had a few issues, um, hence the, the, the defects we're fixing uh, further down the list here, uh, as well as some feedback on, on some of the things that uh, would be helpful. This first one is, is basically, um, I would probably argue this should be a defect rather than enhancement, but um, when, we, when we added this capability, um, we didn't change the validation for when you add data, data into the account, add account transfer screen. So it was possible for you to create an account transfer that would be perfectly valid to send via text as a swift message, but actually would fail to go over the BACS network because BACS had stricter validation. So a number of things we we did tighten up on, but we didn't tighten up on some of the stuff in, in that add account transfer dialogue that we probably should have done. So it was possible to set up some things um, that would then fail to generate a BACS message further down the line. Um, so we've just tightened up on the validation there and it shouldn't be possible anymore to, to create a case that's a BACS transfer case that's not valid to go through BACS unless it's for reasons like, you know, you use a bank account that really doesn't exist and they, they run their validation on it and so on. Um, next one on the list, uh, so we're talking here about um, uh, multi-select. So lots of stuff you can do in the um, normal account transfer world uh, or the text account transfer world. If I go back to my first browser, um, so uh, there are lots of cases in the in the normal world that you can um, uh, bulk select things. So you can bulk select crest assets on the transfer asset screen to, to confirm them all in one go. You can release a bunch of asset re-reg instructions at the same time. Um, when we added the backs piece, we didn't add multi-select for many operations. Um, because to be honest, we thought there'd be a lower volume and that people might want to look at them more because there's a, bit, a slightly more manual process, but it turns out that we were wrong. Uh, and so various operations, including, for example, the instructs. We've got three new backs transfers here. 
you can now using the kind of click click uh, sorry um, control and shift click operations like you would in, in many other uh, Windows applications you can multi select items in here and, um, all the various things you would normally do um, and then you have the options to uh, perform multiple operations uh, an operation of multiple items there so we can instruct all those backs transfers in one go uh, and they will then be available for download and export the backs um, next one on the list is doing the pen date in in, uh, in the grid so this is quite a key one actually that good bit of feedback from a couple of clients on this one that um, within the backs transfer process um, you can send a transfer to a counterparty say please go ahead and, and transfer this 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 uh, ISA to me they can come back and say let's say for example the client has um, uh, a fixed term ISA and it's got six months left on it they can send back something to say that's fine but we're going to pend this until some date in the future um, which is all very well and good for those of you who are prepared to wait for that transfer to happen um, but unless you actually went into each individual case or exported this data somewhere else there wasn't a convenient way of seeing which cases were now due um, and so perfectly sensible request was that we add this pen date into the, the account transfers grid here so that basically you can filter on this for anything that's, that's in the past and that will show you any any case that's due now and therefore if it hasn't started to happen you should be chasing um, so that was hopefully quite straightforward that's that column there which again will be turned off by default you'll need to turn that on if you want to use it and just in case you're not aware how to do that under all the columns you've got this little drop down menu and there's a columns list in there you can pick all the columns you want and drag and drop these around to rearrange them and so on um, next one uh, backs URN on the message screens um, so if I go into our backs message monitor so this one really is, is just about um, in the background when we when we have a bunch of these uh, transfer cases that we've we've exported here um, ready to send out the door um, we can then go off and generate our document that we take and upload onto backs um, when we do that when we generate the messages um, for these cases we have to generate a whole raft of weird and wonderful very specific backs formatted uh, reference numbers um, and sometimes when errors come back from backs or if a counterparty wants to question you about a case you need to know that reference um, but in particular uh, if you for example try and load a file into backs and it fails it might give you that reference and the feedback was it'd be very useful to see for each of these cases um, that reference number that we've generated um, so that you can use that to tie things back for, for debugging and, and, and reconciliation and, and investigation purposes so that change there is just to add this, uh, this backs reference onto that screen um, and then we're jumping now to the bottom two on the list of the change note uh, down to the ability to abort um, a backs transfer from the release date so I'm not going to show this one um, this was uh, an omission on our part so in essence in the backs world you're pretty much free to, to decide not to go over the transfer at pretty much any point during the transfer so even once you've sent the transfer request you can then say actually I don't want to do that after all uh, and, and, and abort the transfer case which will send a, a cancel message is it to the, an abandoned message to the other party um, so that's just that for those of you who use the backs piece that's down now available to you and the very last one um, the wrapper transfer date on backs transfers so um, back to the account transfers view um, so batch transfers have an additional transfer date in them um, for reasons that I won't go into right here and now um, if you use the backs piece you, you'll, you'll be familiar with this um, and, and this is where you as the acquiring party specify the date that you so I'll go into slightly more detail so in, in, the, in the, the text world when we send a transfer instruction to the seeding party it's the seeding party who uh, denotes the date at which the wrapper is transferring so they basically set a date typically the day that you send the confirmation message saying this is the date legally that we're transferring the wrapper to you um, in the backs world the acquiring party gets to choose that date um, albeit they might, they might be rejected by the seeding party but the acquiring party chooses a date and therefore we have a separate field that you can populate that date into um, rather than the wrapper transfer date that we've always had what we weren't doing however um, is that when uh, a transfer is is processed through backs we never fill out or we weren't ever filling out the wrapper transfer date with that backs transfer date um, and unfortunately that was silly because the wrapper transfer date is what's used for the ISA annual return that people generate out of us or at least the, the skeleton of it that you can then complete um, and in fact it was causing that return to break for people that had done backs transfers because there wasn't a wrapper transfer date 
for those BACS transfers uh, at all. Um, so we can see for this particular case here, um, once it becomes, uh, well, once it gets to the, the point that it's processed, not doesn't have to get as far as closed, once it gets processed, we copy the, uh, the BACS transfer date that we've requested as the acquiring party into the essentially actual wrapper transfer date. Uh, those transfer cases can then be processed uh, in the annual return and that information is available to you. So uh, that's the last of the BACS cases. Are there any other questions or comments? Anybody that wants to go for that um, before we move on? I've had a question about pensions, okay. actually, um, yeah. which is, again, from Jesse asking, is there a reason why tranches are specified in units as opposed to value? Um, so uh, the tranches themselves, Jesse, do have a value on, well, do uh, they? Yes. The, the tranche data has, has values within them, um, but holdings are always, I mean, <laughs> Holdings are always specified in units. This is a massive bugbear of mine, and if anybody on the call agrees that it would be sensible for holdings to be passed, perhaps both as unit and value, uh, I would suggest you go to the market practice and say that would be a good idea, uh, and then we can make that change. Um, I think it's crackers that we don't pass values around for holdings everywhere, personally. I think the seeding party, they know the values, they've got prices, they know the unit amounts. It's trivial to do, in my view. Do shout or raise your hand and tell me I'm wrong if you think so. Um, but it's craziness that we don't pass values around, in my opinion. Um, but the tranche data does have uh, values within them, um, just not broken down on the individual assets themselves. Um, and that's because the market practice is, is that way. That's not, it's not us, that's market practice. And I would very much like to change it. Anyone else for any else before I move on? Conversion is the next big piece. No, there's nothing else at the moment. Cool. Okay, right. So, conversions. Um, so, I'm going to put up a diagram to talk through conversions for a minute. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk about what we've done and, and where we've got to. So, um, <clears throat> obviously, there are lots of different share classes in the world these days. Uh, and increasingly, some of the bigger players are getting their own special share classes, and it's not like we have a clean and a super clean. There are super cleans and super duper cleans and squeaky cleans and all sorts of other words that I, I dream up sometimes. Uh, and it's meant that, as we've seen from some of the stats we've run in the past and, and anecdotally, and then obviously the FCA are looking at it as well, it seems like there are more and more scenarios where customers are either not transferring or are selling assets rather than transferring them in specie. Um, because of a mismatch of share classes between different platforms and different providers. Um, the market practice has gone some way towards dealing with this problem, although, as I voiced, I felt it wasn't enough. Uh, and there is, in fact, now a change request going into the next version of market practice, which I'll come on to. Um, but what market practice has done today, so, so this diagram, some of you will recognize um, from, from, from previous sessions and, and from documentation we might have sent to you, but this is the, the kind of fairly standard transfer process. Um, we've got an acquiring, an acquiring platform. Um, hang on, I'm being asked to put this full screen. I don't know how that works on here, so it might blow everything up. Um, we'll try it and see. No, it doesn't work, like I thought. So I can't do it while I'm going to. So I won't. Um, so, um, we, uh, the market practice has, has dealt with this one leg of the transfer process. So this, this is a standard transfer process between acquiring a seeding party where the acquiring party uses a custodian with a fund manager involved. So in our normal transfer process, we'll send an information request and we'll get back an information response. Now, let's say we've got an, imagine, an imaginary Altus fund which has an end share class. So the seeding party, they've got this end share class, they send it back in the information request, uh, information response, sorry. Now, if the acquiring party has information about that end share class, um, but they know they can't hold it, they are now under market practice within their rights, within the portfolio transfer instruction to say, can you please re-register share class N to me? But actually, before you re-register it to me, can you please convert it to share class A? Um, now, it's not mandatory currently for that seeding party to honor that request. Um, but I think many of you realize that the FCA will look pretty dimly on that and may well mandate that as of next year. Um, so we've built this further support for this stuff because we think this is coming whether you like it or not. 
Um, but hopefully many of you will be comfortable to perform this conversion. I know some of you do today already um, offer this conversion capability, but the market practice allows you just in that one message to say, please convert this to this before you re-register it to me. At that point, when you confirm back again, uh, you will say, yes, I confirm that I am going to transfer N to you, um, but I'm going to convert it to A. Um, but at this point, the holdings you pass back are still in relation to share class N because we don't know what the holdings are yet because we haven't got A to know what's going on. However, because the acquiring party has been told that the seeding party is going to convert to share class A, in the case where they use a custodian, they will send a transfer in expectation to their custodian saying, please expect share class A to arrive uh, on your book soon um, with, with the, the reference that would normally pass through this chain to allocate to us. Uh, and they will sit there quietly waiting for that to happen. Now, in the meantime, the normal process would be that the seeding party asked to do a re-reg would send a transfer out instruction to the fund manager. But because they've been asked under market practice here to convert that before re-reg, they will now go through a separate process. Now, theoretically, and, and ATG supports this being a manual process. So uh, if you're one of these requests and the fund manager, which obviously today, as we speak, no fund managers are electronically supporting this, but we'll come on to that later. Hopefully some of them might. Um, then the seeding party can manually instruct the fund manager uh, on paper, facts, however you do these things, um, to please convert from, a, uh, from N to A. So that's what this process is showing here. Um, we can send a conversion instruction saying, please convert from N to A, and the fund manager will come back and, co and confirm that and say, yep, yeah, and we've, we've converted from, from uh, N units in group one, group two into uh, you know, B units in, in, in A, um, at which point, the seeding party now holds share class A on, on their register for that customer, and therefore they then would send a transfer out instruction to the fund manager to re-reg share class A, because that's now what they hold. They would go through the normal process, they'd update their register, they'd confirm that back to the seeding party. The uh, fund manager would also confirm that back to the acquiring party, who in this case would be the custodian, because we'd have told them that in the portfolio transfer instruction. They would update their records, and in turn, pass that back. Not there, that should have gone right the way back to here. Let's just show that. That would go back somewhere there. Um, and the acquiring party would say, great, I've got my units, brilliant. Um, seeding party would meanwhile be finishing off their transfer case, they'd send their payment advice and they'd send their transfer complete. Now, that could be where the process finishes, but um, there is a chance that we know that um, share class A is the only thing that the seeding party is prepared to convert to but actually, we've got our own special share class um, that perhaps the seeding party couldn't hold and therefore we couldn't request that they transfer straight from N to B. So post-conversion, sorry, post-transfer, we're within our rights. And again, ATG will manage this process for you, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, you are within your rights to then send your own conversion instruction, potentially via a custodian, to say, OK, I've got share class A. I'd like share class B, please. Um, so you could send that downstream to a custodian who would in turn send that onto a fund manager, or indeed that could be sent direct, and they would in turn come back with a conversion confirmation saying, yeah, we've done that, um, and if that's via a custodian, they would come back to you telling you that's done. Um, now, there's a number of things that have happened there, and I'm going to explain what we have done and what we are yet to do. So, first of all, um, we've built, if I can find my mouse cursor, there it is. Uh, no, it's gone, where's my mouse? I've had no cursor. Control. It's not very helpful for people who can't see it. <laughs> uh, okay, my cursor disappeared, so I can't show you my cursor. Um, but I'll talk about it. So where we've got the portfolio transfer instruction, which says N to A. Uh, so we built the support in there for the uh, acquiring party to instruct the seeding party. Beyond that, though, we've built some config data, which I'll show you in a second, that allows the acquiring party to identify when there's a conversion possible um, to prompt for you to, um, to update that, that transfer asset, particularly when it's an unsupported asset, to, to favor a conversion. Um, similarly, on the seeding side, we've built the capability for you to receive those conversion instructions within that portfolio transfer instruction. Um, we also built the capability for you to automatically reject them if you don't want to support them, although obviously we're going to hope that people will. Um, and uh, again, we've got config there that you can build that will say what you will and won't support from a conversion point of view. So. Um, you might be only prepared to, as is the, uh, the suggestion that's gone through text and hopefully to the FCA now, which I'll come on to in a second, uh, it may be that you, you will only go via 
the, the kind of standard retail or, or platform share class, you know, typically the 75 bit share class. Um, on top of that, um, if you're prepared to go ahead with the transfer, um, we've built the facility such that once you confirm your transfer, um, if you said there's a conversion that uh, you're going to perform, that it will take you through that, that transfer process, be it manually, or hopefully, if we can uh, get some fund managers on board, um, and there are fund managers that are talking to us about doing this as we speak, so hopefully there will be some before too long. Um, we have also built electronic conversion capability to instruct the fund managers uh, and receive both acceptance and confirmation messages as they are under the UK FMPG conversions market practice. So this is a standard that I mentioned that, that Ben and I got together with a bunch of other people earlier in the year and reinvigorated a, a standard we built a few years ago when, when RDR first came along, frankly, and everyone thought there was going to be a proliferation of share classes back then. Um, we decided back then we'd build a conversions market practice that no one wanted to use at the time. We've dusted that off, updated it slightly, um, and we've now built support for that. So we have the ability for a, a seeding party to send conversion instructions to fund managers. We've also obviously therefore built the capability for fund managers to receive those conversion instructions, process them, and send confirmations uh, and optionally acceptance messages back in in the middle um, as per that market practice. Um, and uh, the other thing we've built around that also is the ability for ATG to learn what valid conversions are. So rather than you guys having to on day one go out and set up a whole new raft of config data to set this up and understand the whole industry, um, what we've done is that every time ATG sees a conversion that happens successfully, it will automatically set up new rules for you to determine conversions that are possible. It won't make them your favorites or, or mandate they happen automatically, but it will learn what is and isn't acceptable. Um, so you can mark things as, as not valid conversions or conversions you're not prepared to support, um, but it will learn automatically which things have gone through successfully and therefore which are valid, even if you don't necessarily want to perform them. Um, following on from that, uh, if we go down to the bottom of the diagram there, We've also built the capability so that um, if you set up, uh, and this is an if, it will only happen if you set these rules up, if you set up preferred conversions that say, given share class A or B or C, um, I prefer share class whatever, N, um, that uh, via config you can turn on another, another set of capability that says post-transfer, once I've received confirmation of a transfer in of an asset, if I have a rule that says that the share class I've transferred in is not the preferred share class that I would actually like, it can automatically start the process, and again, hopefully electronically with the fund manager in time, um, to perform that conversion to convert from the share class that you've, you've received in to the preferred share class, hopefully a preferential share class, and, and putting the customer into the into the best position, which again is a, a piece that the FCA, we believe, are going to look very very carefully at, uh, making sure people are always in the, the most beneficial share class to them. Um, the last thing uh, that I'm going to talk about now that I will demonstrate at least today um, is standalone conversions. So obviously in the whole re-reg world, we've got the, the, the standard transfer process we're talking through here, but a lot of you will perform um, standalone transfers, particularly for things like um, bulk book movements or, or migrations, etc. cetera, uh, but also for corrections and things like that. Um, so we've also built standalone conversions so that again, you can either track manual and or send electronic conversions to fund managers. Um, so, you know, if we had this back in the day when people were doing their, their kind of dirty to clean migrations, you could have used it for that. But again, we know there's a lot of people at the moment that have customers that aren't always automatically converted to the most preferential share class. Um, that feature will be able to be used for that, uh, which again, I think the FCA are going to be looking quite carefully at, so that's probably a useful feature. Um, but again, you know, people might bulk convert when they, when they get a new special deal or if uh, particularly for, for clients we think where you have um, uh, multiple kind of uh, offerings within it, you might have different share classes that are available to different, uh, different propositions, for example. Um, the last thing that I'll mention um, is the custodian or the RUH part of conversion. So on this diagram here, we can see the seeding party, sorry, my apologies, the, the acquiring party on this post-transfer conversion as we refer to it, um, sending a conversion instruction to their custodian. Um, Obviously, the custodian will then need to manage that and send that downstream. So in exactly the same way as we have the, the kind of custody or, or, or IUH support in ATG for transfers, we are building, um, but haven't finished yet, the capability for custodians to do conversions as well. Now, that brings me on to an important point here, which is that um, this release that you've, you've all been delivered uh, yesterday into your UAT environment, so in fact, it happened on Friday, but it was 
which are publicly available as of yesterday. That is um, feature complete in terms of everything market practice and everything that was originally planned for that release. Um, however, um, we didn't have enough time to finish all of the conversions capability that we wanted to deliver. So with all the kind of noise that's been going around, uh, around conversions and, and the FCA's interest uh, and the likely mandation of some of the conversions next year, we felt it was important to deliver this conversion capability in this release. So the release you've got is feature complete outside of conversions. It's feature complete for everything in market practice. It is interface complete. The interfaces will not be changing um, past what you've received in your tech packs today or yesterday. Um, however, we do still have a planned release mid UAT to deliver this final piece of conversions capability. Um, we'll also use it if there's any bugs that come out that clients find um, that, that, that we need to fix um, from this release. We'll also use it to patch those things. But there will be a release coming later in, um, in this UAT period, probably midway through UAT, just to kind of give time for the testings um, for us to find any other defects we need to fix that will deliver the RUH um, conversion capability. And it will also finish, because it isn't quite finished, um, the standalone conversion capability, which, which I'll demonstrate in a moment. Um, so just bear that in mind, it is coming, but don't panic about things like we're not going to change any interfaces, it's not going to affect other parts of the system, it is isolated purely to those two conversions uh, parts of the system. So um, shouldn't have any impact, but we believe it's important to deliver that now so that you guys can, can have that and prepare for its use next year with the likelihood of the, uh, the, 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 the um, FCA mandating some of this stuff. So enough waffling, I'll, I'll show you some of this now. So uh, if I can work out how to get my screen back. Now it's in crazy mode. Yeah. So um, one thing we've just been asked is, will you be shown how to set up the rules around the conversion? Uh, I will. So first of all, I'm going to show that right now. Um, but uh, my suggestion is that clients that want to actively support this from, from sort of day one or, or day two, um, let me know uh, and I can talk you through it. Um, we will be providing, once, once conversions is fully finished in a few weeks' time, um, we'll be providing some kind of quick reference guides like we do for some of the other parts of the system around these as well. Um, but, but yes, absolutely we will. Um, but if, if nothing, you know, if we don't get that out in a time frame that you'd like to try some stuff out yourselves in UAT, just drop me a line and we can, uh, we can talk through it individually. So um, very first thing is uh, we're going to config and I'll show you a few settings in here. Um, so actually first one, just very quickly, because um, we do have some fund manager clients these days. Um, I'm going to go into my fund manager. Um, and just very quickly show you the comp oh, not reminders. I keep doing that. The config screen here. So, first of all, if you are a fund manager, um, in your client level configuration screen, um, you used to have an asset re-registration tab in here. It's now called asset management. And um, the reason being that all of these settings in here <coughs> that you had um, are now uh, related to both asset re-reg and conversion. So this controls both sides of those um, those capabilities. So this, this will affect your conversions as well as your re-reg. Um, but if I go back into the platform, this is my platform one account. In here, there are there are no platform, sorry, there are no client level conversion settings. All of the conversion settings are done at the product provider level. Um, so if you've got a single client instance, um, then find your, like I have here, your, your kind of platform one as I've got here. The config on here will control your conversions. But if you are an outsourcer, uh, and you have lots of internal providers, you can set up this conversion support, or you need to set up this conversion support individually for each of those, uh, each of those brands or, or, or counterparties that you support. Um, but it's quite straightforward, um, the, the settings we have in here. Um, the first one essentially says whether or not you will support um, instructions for conversions within a portfolio transfer. Um, the length of the wording had to be shortened to make it fit, but, uh, but that's what that one's about. It's, it's basically saying, um, will, will you support conversions within a portfolio transfer? So if you're a seeding party, if you don't tick that box, we will reject any transfers that you receive asking for a conversion. The second one says whether you would receive, uh, whether you're prepared to receive electronic conversion requests. So that's more relevant to fund managers um, uh, rather than platforms um, per se. Um, or, but also, it also says whether you're prepared to send them electronically, because some people, if there's only one fund manager that's set up for electronic conversions, you might decide you don't want to do that yet, you'd rather do them all on paper still. So it, it does work on both sides, but it's more relevant to fund managers, really. 
Um, so I'd expect all platforms to probably turn that on because I don't see why really you wouldn't send it to a phone manager electronically if you could, um, but the option is there to turn that off if you want to. Uh, and then the last one controls whether or not um, if you have a preferred conversion set up for um, one share class to another, um, whether or not the system should automatically perform that conversion, um, be it manually or, or electronically, post transferring in of an asset. Um, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, so that's where you set up the kind of conversion support. If we then go under um, our, let's find some funds, um, under our assets. So under our funds, if we go to our Altus funds here, we've got a few of these set up. So there's now, uh, as well as your, so under the, each of the fund managers, um, as well as nominee accounts and funds, there's now a conversions option. So if we configure those, in here, so this is what we call supported conversions. So the idea in here is um, that you can set up rules that say, given share class, whatever, I can convert this to, or you cannot convert this to, that's the other option, um, A to B. So here we're saying, you know, for our absolute return bond fund, uh, we're saying that share class A can be converted to share class B, and for share class A, that is our, the star means that is our preferred conversion. So if any of the A, options because A could go to B to C to D etc they might all be permitted conversions but for us if we transfer in share class A we would prefer that we convert it into share class B the tick means it's a supported conversion um, I could add into here and say you know I want to say that um, uh, have you got any that we haven't got in there Beth X to something maybe X to A I think. yeah okay so I could say X to A is not a supported so let's say X was our dirty class and we're not going to support converting that to, to A we can add that in, and that will mean that we won't be allowed to pick that as a conversion as an acquiring party, but similarly, if someone requests, a, requests that we do it as a seeding party, it would automatically reject it. Um, now, as I said, some of these rules will, will add themselves automatically, so if we had none of these rules and we performed a conversion in the system that, that, that did a conversion from N to A, this rule would get added automatically. It wouldn't be marked as a preferred conversion because we don't want to automate anything just off the back of seeing it. Um, but it would mark it as a supported conversion, which then helps you pick conversions later in one of the dialogues I'll show you. But this is fundamentally where you set this stuff up. And again, uh, beyond that, you can also set this up on a per provider basis. So you can set it up at the client level, but you can also say um, uh, which providers you want this one to relate to. So you can basically set up that this is the preferred one for this provider and this provider, but you can set up another one as being the preferred so you know, if, if, if provider one prefers share class B and provider two prefers share class C, you can set up different rules to say this is preferred for, flat, for platform one, but this other one is preferred for, flat, for platform two. You don't have to have them all, all at the same way, although I imagine they often will be. And again, if you want to set this stuff up and, and you're in that world, um, just let us know. Um, but I'm going to take that out in case it breaks the demo that we've set up. Oh, not there, sorry. <clears throat> So that's the kind of basics of the config. So there's not, not much to it. Um, obviously, if you know all of the rules in the world, we can we can support all this stuff being uploaded via CSV and that sort of stuff. Um, but my expectation is more likely that people might set up their own kind of, you know, uh, whatever the, so people that have restricted chair classes, I imagine might set up some of these um, these preferred rules to convert from from a, a retail class, say, to their special share classes, but um, for other people, you don't need to set any data up necessarily. So we go across to account transfers and actually look at one of these in action. Um, so, that one? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so, here we've got a case that best set up for us, which is uh, the GIA. We've done a discovery, so it's come back, it's in our verified state, um, and uh, Sure, it's this one. Uh, yes, it is because Martin's on sport, isn't it? So, so this this asset that we've discovered, um, share class N. If we went back and looked in the config, this is marked as an unsupported asset. So the system has automatically marked it for encashment. However, it's highlighted that there is a supported conversion available. So this is one of the ones where we've actually got on those rules. Um, just because there is, is is a rule here, sorry. If there wasn't a rule here, it doesn't preclude us from saying, okay, but I'd like to convert this, please. So we can always add a supported convert, sorry, we can always add a conversion if we want to. Um, but this is actually telling us that we've got a rule set up here saying, well, actually, there's one here that we could convert to if you want to, that we know about. 
So we can look at this and say, you know, okay, actually, no, we're happy to encash it. Or we can say, okay, actually, I'd like to convert it. Um, and if there wasn't a support, supported one, you can still say, I'd like to convert. You just have to specify um, the from and to share classes to, to, to do within the conversion. But doing that there will basically update the case and say, right, we're going to go in species in that case. We're going to convert to um, this other share class, this A share class in this case. And importantly, it's going to change for this asset the nominee account details to be the nominee account details of share class A. So we could have, you know, it might be that we support share class N, but we want it in share class A. So it might be that when this asset came in, it was it was in specie and it picked up the nominee account details for share class N, but we're still within our rights to say, actually, can you convert it to A first, please? And when we do that, it will change the nominee account details to be relevant to the asset that we're going to transfer into, not the one we're asking to transfer from. So we go ahead and do that. That's now showing us that the icon's gone solid. So we've now got a conversion that we're going to request as part of this transfer. Um, we're saying here that we've got a pending pre-transfer conversion. So we're asking for it to be converted to share class A. Um, and now we're just ready to go ahead. So I'm going to go ahead and approve and release this. Uh, and then we're going to have to flip across to our seeding party side to see uh, how this pans out on their side. So I'll release that. And then we're going to change browsers and go across to seeding party. And then if the comms have worked quickly enough, there we go. We've now got our transfer outs been requested. And we can see straight away here that we've got a conversion requested. Now, for those of you who are fully integrated, um, you obviously might on day one want to say, well, we're fully integrated, so we can't support these conversions yet. Uh, and therefore, you'll have the, the config set to not support them. Um, obviously, if you want to support them, you will need to make changes to integration if you're integrated. Um, uh, but all of the data around what's been requested and what share class and so on is available within the, the normal data objects that come out for these transfer assets. Um, but uh, obviously, again, if you want to look at that, give us a shout and we can talk through the details with you. Um, so we can see in here that we've been requested to pre-transfer, sorry, to, to convert pre-transfer this asset into this share class A. Now, we're fully within our rights here to go back and reject it if we, if we don't like this for some reason. If we'd set up a rule in this client that said you can't do N to A, it would automatically uh, reject this case and go back again. Um, but if we're happy with it, we do nothing more than our normal process at this stage. So right now, we're going to add our normal holdings. And at this point, we're adding holdings for share class N because that's what we hold. So I'll say we've got 1,000 units and 2,000 units. Notice the other one wasn't being um, requested for conversion, so that's just a standard process. Um, if this was a, a GIA, uh, sorry, an ISA or a SIP or a pension, we'd be doing some more wrapper stuff. But here we can just go ahead and say, great, that's done. So we'll approve all our asset data and release our case. Now, obviously, in the normal world that you guys are used to today, this bottom asset here will, um, in a second, be marked as sent. Um, because it's been sent to the fund manager for re-registration. But we can see that our first line has gone into a conversion requested state. Now, if this was a, a manually, uh, sorry, a fund manager that was manually supporting conversions, um, at this point, uh, we would um, have a little hand icon and we, we go through the process manually. And all the options are here for um, generating our conversion requests, marking it as sent in the same way as if you sent a stock transfer form. All those kind of operations are there, including the manual confirm operation to um, to mark when the conversion has occurred, but also to key in the converted two unit amounts because we need to know what unit amounts we've, we've, we've got for the for the new asset. Um, but if we move this on a bit, this is an electronic one, so it's now become conversion sent. So they've both been sent to the fund manager, but one is an asset re-reg and one is a conversion request. So if I go to the fund manager um, and change, first of all, I'll go to the conversion screen. So here is our conversion request screen. This is the fund manager view for those conversions that come through. And we can see here that we've had this conversion from provider two saying, please convert from share class N to share class A, um, X number of units within this account. Obviously, same sort of thing as a re-reg. We're just gonna look at those basic details, decide whether it's valid. If not, we can reject it. Um, and it's worth mentioning that if we reject it, just like we have for, for re-reg steps, we've got repair operations on the, on the seeding side. Um, you've even got the option on the seeding side to change the share class that it's going to convert into. Um, obviously, if you do that, you need to let the acquiring party know. So, you know, if the, if the fund manager says they can't have that share class, you could speak to the acquiring party, agree a different share class with them, and there's an option on both the acquiring and the seeding sides to change the share class that you're converting into um, before you then resubmit it to the fund manager to, to then process it. 
Um, but hopefully it's all okay. And if it's okay, there's then going to be a confirmed dialogue. Uh, again, I, I imagine the fund managers will automate this in the same way as they automate re-registration. Um, so let's say we've got a thousand units in group one, uh, and that goes to a thousand and three units in in uh, in our, our A share class. Um, so we do that conversion, release that back out the door, and that will go straight back up to the uh, seeding party to tell them that conversion is complete. And then when we get back to uh, the seeding party side, now watch this carefully. Uh, we're currently here saying we've got uh, our absolute return bond fund N uh, in species conversion sent. When I refresh this, the eagle eyed of you will notice that this now says fund A, because that's what we now hold. The conversion has happened, and it's now sent the re-reg instruction. So if we look at the, um, the history on here, we can see that we sent a conversion, it was converted, um, and then we've sent our asset transfer instruction. Now, at this point, we then see that we've now converted from the end share class. So we've, we've flipped these two assets around because we've done the conversion. Um, we can see the units that we loaded, we can see the units we converted from, and we can now see the units we've converted to. So for those that are integrated, this would be one of these kind of points that you'd want to add into your integration set to update your, um, your, your platform or your records to say, okay, Mr. Blogs, uh, or Debbie Jones in this case, now holds um, share class A in this number of units rather than share class N in this number of units. Um, but once that's happened, as I say, that's now gone back out to the fund manager um, to do the re-reg. Um, so if I go back downstream to them, uh, actually I'm not going to do that yet, I'm going to go back to the acquiring side and show you all that first before we get away with ourselves. So back on the acquiring side, um, our transfer has all been accepted. Um, we, uh, I'm trying to show you, um, we've still got the conversion pending here. Um, and we don't know that it's happened yet, so we're still saying it's a pre-transfer conversion because we don't know where the seeding party's got to. It's only when the, when the, when the, the fund manager confirmation arrives at us do we see this piece um, uh, change to being our, um, uh, our confirmed units in, in, the, in that new share class. But again, you can see that when the acceptance came back, when the seeding party confirmed that we were um, going to go ahead with the conversion, we've now flipped this to share class A, showing that we're going to retreat, uh, receive share class A in through the door, not share class N. So down at the fund manager, uh, if we go across to the asset re-reg view, they've now got these two asset re-reg instructions from us, one for the one that wasn't converted, um, which I think was for 2,000 units, yeah. So we'll confirm that one and release it. And then we've got our uh, our converted <coughs> share class A, um, which we will confirm and release. And that will all send the message upstream to both the uh, seeding and acquiring parties. So if I go back to my seeding side of the fence and refresh all of this, those have now come back confirmed. Uh, we've got our confirmed units, but again, confirmed units in our, in our A share class, because that's what we held at that point and the other asset is confirmed as well. Now, as I said, this is now basically complete on the seeding party side. There's no cash in this case, so we'll just close this down uh, and send that transfer complete message back to the acquiring party. Um, back on the acquiring side, however, um, so we're not set up using a custodian here because, as I say, we haven't yet built that custody, well, haven't finished the build of that, of that conversion piece through the IUH, but if there was, we'd have been sending um, conversion instructions down to the, uh, sorry, Reread instructions, transferring expectations to the to the custodian, and now what we would have done. Um, so this has come back, confirmed from the fund manager. Once it was confirmed, because we had the config setting turned on that said automatically convert to a preferred share class, and because we had a rule that said if I if I transfer in share class A, I prefer to transfer that to share class B. We've automatically sent a conversion in this case electronically down to the fund manager. So we've got our confirm units in. We've automatically said, yeah, that's great, but please convert it. So again, if we go back to our fund manager and go to uh, our conversion requests, we can see now platform one, the acquiring party in this scenario has now sent us a request saying, please convert from share class A to share class B within this, this nominee account. Um, and 
they will hopefully go ahead and perform that conversion. Uh, let's say we now get 1,002 units. Um, I appreciate my numbers are probably nonsense, but still. Uh, release that, and that will then come back up to our acquiring party. And again, if we watch that, that's currently saying it's share class A. If I refresh that, that becomes share class B because it's come back from the fund manager as converted. We can see all of our converted from and to units. We've got the history of the fact that it was converted from in uh, pre-transfer by the seeding party, converted um, via share class A. So it went from N to A to us as B. Um, all that details in within our transfer assets, that's all available via integration again. Um, and again, like I said, when we're doing these conversions, we've now got this point where when, it, when an asset becomes converted, that's another key integration point for those of you who integrate to, to update your records to show that the clients flip from one share class to another. Um, that's the basic conversion process. Um, just quickly, I'll just show you the skeleton of the uh, standalone conversion screen. So you have got this, you can set these things up, but the ad screen is a bit limited at the moment. We didn't have quite time to finish this. So um, you can set up standalone conversions, but the, um, uh, the, the nominee account picker and so forth doesn't work properly yet. So this is just boxes at the minute, whereas eventually it will be based on the assets that you pick. Um, so you can play around with this if you want to, but again, it works in exactly the same way as standalone transfers. It allows you to support conversions outside of a transfer case, um, be it manually or electronically with the fund manager, um, and uh, allow you to perform those as and when you choose. Um, again, all of these can be bulk uploaded via CSV, uh, they can be done via API, just in the same way as all that conversion stuff that we did on the account transfer side, all of that's available via API, and similarly you can export these things in, in um, uh, CSVs and in, uh, CSV imports and exports, you can use those in as well. Um, I think for conversions, that's everything. Yep. Yeah. Uh, any questions on conversions? Nothing there at the moment. That's cool. Good, okay. Um, obviously, this, this, well, hopefully that's quite intuitive and straightforward. Um, obviously, as, as I said before, if anybody's interested in setting that up for day one, which I hope some of you are, because I think it's the direction of travel, and I think it's better to get on it sooner rather than later. Um, the downside is I do have to say uh, there, is, uh, there is a charge for the conversions uh, in as much as we count conversions uh, in the same way as we do other transfers. Um, so um, don't be surprised if, they, if you do use them, they will start appearing in your, in your charging counts. Um, anything else, anything there? No more questions, good, okay. Um, so, that's all the demonstrations of anything we're going to show, all the things we talked about on the, on the release note. Um, in a minute, we will open things up to people asking questions. Um, so in a minute, if you want to raise your hand or, or type a question in, we'll go to more of a kind of open floor and, and, and unmute some people on the phone side if you want to ask anything. Um, last couple of things to mention, though. So firstly, um, this is a, uh, a significant release. Uh, it, it's that release note is actually relatively short because what, what we've done, so just, just to clarify, we've changed the way we're doing release notes now so that we don't highlight every single underlying technical change we make. We group things together now into um, uh, functional changes essentially because we think it's clearer for, for business users to understand what we're talking about. Uh, and therefore the change note is, is shorter than it would normally be. But I can assure you in reality the number of active issues we've dealt with to do all these things is probably five or six times the size of many of our other release notes. So I cannot stress enough how big a change this release is. There is an awful lot of change going into this release. There's an awful lot of new capability in certain areas. Some of it's very isolated, so some of you aren't affected by much of this at all. But I really, really, really do urge you to test the system um, in terms of your own usage. Uh, we say this every single time we do a release, and um, if I'm honest, very, very few of you ever do any testing in UAT. Uh, and then the first few days of production, lots and lots of problems come out of the woodwork. Now, as much as if problems come out of the woodwork uh, when we hit production, obviously we will fix those things because they'll be our fault if there are problems. Um, but for your benefit, we really, really do recommend that if you have the time and effort um, that you test as much as you can in any of these areas that you think are affected, uh, that, that you're affected by. If you're unsure as to whether something affects you, please contact support or, or myself or Beth um, to ask any specific questions. Um, but Cannot stress enough, this is a big, big release. Um, really, really do feel that clients need to do testing uh, of their processes to make sure they're comfortable. We haven't Im Im impacted your, your process uh, in any negative way. 
Yeah, and in, in terms of your integration, if you are an API integrated client, you would have been sent the um, integration pack yesterday. You do have to recompile. That is mandatory for all clients. Um, if you do anything in relation to product providers, so if you update them through API, if you pull them, if you check things when you're doing a transfer, the, um, as some of you may have noticed, we the support UK, whatever it's filled, yes, latest UK F&P field has been removed completely. Um, so if you're doing anything with that field, that is no longer available. Um, and there's now an additional few fields like Nick showed you in relation to specifying if you support conversions and things like that. Um, if you have CSV command tools, you would have been sent those as well. They've all been upgraded. Um, the things that you might need to check yourself, so if you have any custom CSV imports, exports, checkers, handlers, do custom processes, notifications, document templates, that's the type of thing that we really recommend that you test as part of this release as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, obviously we do do a lot of testing. We do um, client acceptance testing, but we don't know every single formula of every single thing every client does. So we really do strongly recommend for this release. There's a lot of change. You guys need to need to do some testing here, uh, and hopefully the three months you've got is, is ample time for you to do so. Um, Again, any questions on that, you want any help understanding what your impacts might be, do give us a shout. I'm not trying to scare you, just trying to kind of prepare people. You know, I think it's, it's just really important this time around with, with the scale of this release and the size of the market practice change and so on that people are aware of what's gone on to make sure that you're going into it with your eyes open. Um, the last thing I just want to say, um, obviously, uh, hopefully you've got lots of useful information out of this session. Um, uh, if you haven't, by all means tell me what to do better. Um, but uh, another very useful source of information, obviously, is our ATG user group, uh, which is always good fun. Uh, I might have another voting app uh, session this time, so if those of you enjoyed that last time. Um, so uh, we, um, uh, we've already sent out the uh, registration slips for everyone. If you haven't had your registration invite for the ATG user group, let us know, because you should have done. Um, lots of people have, lots of people have already registered, um, but not everybody. There are some firms, some, some quite notable firms that haven't registered yet. Um, so for those of you who aren't aware, let us know if you need an invite. Uh, it's on the 1st of October in London, um, and uh, all the details on the invite, but if you need to uh, need to get one, just let us know. Um, do urge you to come along. Obviously, those of you who come regularly, you'll know how useful it is. Um, there's going to be quite a lot of um, voting and debating this time. There's quite a few things we'd like to get your, your views on in terms of direction this time around again. Um, and uh, we've got a number of quite interesting speakers, including the FCA, giving hopefully some highlights, possibly even some insights and some early information about what they're going to state later in the year in terms of their conclusion on their platform paper and what they're going to mandate and when. Um, uh, it's not at the normal venue. Uh, it's near St Paul's. Yeah, it's in a big, big um, venue, much bigger venue. Uh, yeah, much bigger. There's too many of you these days, so we, we can't fit into our, our lovely friends at SCI's place anymore, which is a real shame because they're, they're great to us. Um, but no, we, we, we're just down the road at, at, um, at St Paul's now. Um, and all the details are on the invite. So please do register. Uh, other than that, I'm going to we, well, we shut up for a, a second. We have had a question. Yeah. Yeah, um, so we've had a question about the integration in relation to that supports UK FMP version flag. How do we need to change our integration in order to handle the removal of this field? We've been using this to donate expectation that transfer status will go to release as opposed to discover. So where people are currently doing it to determine if they do cash transfers or not. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, so, uh, well, you can ask that one if you like. You want me to answer it? Okay. Um, so, uh, f fundamentally, um, it shouldn't have any real impact because uh, the the impact of it is that everybody now um, will support uh, uh, the, the latest version of market practice. So, the, the simple answer is that um, you don't need to inspect it anymore and that you don't need to include it in any integration where you're updating or, or downloading provider data. Um, the behavior of, of all providers will now be the same um, and will will support the full version of market practice. So my recommendation would be, well, no, it's entirely up to you how you do things, obviously, but, but my view would be do as little as possible because the only thing you need to do is ignore it. Um, the impact is, is that everyone will do, so where the flag was true before, Everyone will now essentially be true, so you can remove that conditionality and just do the same thing always. Uh, 
So we have another question from Gary. Hi, Gary. Um, the book cost changes, Gary. Um, so Gary said, can we please run through the book cost changes again? So um, this is uh, an introduction, Gary, in, in, the, in the messaging that goes to custodians. So um, when you send a transfer in instruction, so if you're an acquiring party and you um, send a, a portfolio transfer instruction, a rapid transfer instruction to a seeding party, and they have provided in their confirmation back to you book costs. Um, if you use a custodian, the transfer in instruction that would be automatically sent to the custodian um, for that asset will now include the book cost data um, so that the custodian has access to that same information. Um, that's it really, that, that is the extent of the change. So it, it's nothing, nothing in, in the kind of wrapper exchange is purely about forwarding that information if provided downstream to a custodian because some clients the custodian essentially holds the actual books and records on behalf of the of the platform say uh, and therefore it's really the custodian needs the book cost not actually the the, the kind of acquiring platform provider themselves um, so hopefully that makes sense yeah thank you yes thank you thank you for thanking me uh, that's cool uh, anybody else for any questions either to type it or if you want to ask a question out loud raise your hand and we can uh, we can answer that that way No, nothing else at the minute. So what we'll do, as, as always, some people like to ask questions once everyone else has gone. Um, so we'll hang around for a few minutes. Uh, but unless, Beth, you've got anything else we need to mention, I think that's no. everything. So um, thank you very much for... Apart from being. that we've recorded this session. Oh, yes. Very good point. <laughs> uh, so we record the webinars these days. So if anybody couldn't attend uh, that you know of that wants to, to listen in to me drone on, um, then let us know. Um, I think we'll probably send it out in the, in the follow-up email. Yeah, we'll, we'll send that an email the next day or two. Uh, with a link to that video so that you can watch this back um, if you have trouble going to sleep, uh, anything like that. Um, obviously, if there's any questions that crop up, post this, drop us a note, uh, and we'll come back to you. Um, and obviously, uh, yes, uh, you can have a copy of the slides, Andrew. Yes, we can send those out. That's not a problem. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll send out a copy of those. So it, it, it's, uh, it's the kind of, it, it's a full pack of all the transfer scenarios. We'll send all of it anyway, but yeah, it's that last slide on conversions that's the one relevant today, but yeah, we'll send those out as well. Um, so yeah, obviously, as I say, big release, um, lots to do. Feel free to, to call on us, do ask us for help if you need it, uh, and um, we will uh, we'll be here to support you. Um, just to clarify, it often happens. If you need support, please do contact support. Don't come direct to Beth and I alone. By all means, copy us in. Um, but we're both often out and about seeing you guys. So um, if you do need help with anything, please go via support, copying us if you wish, uh, and we can always make sure that someone gets back to you as soon as possible. Uh, otherwise, things do tend to get missed for a day or two sometimes. Um, but that's it. Thank you very much indeed. We'll hang about for a few minutes in case anybody wants to pipe up once there's less people here. Uh, but other than that, thanks very much for attending, and look forward to seeing you all in October at the user group. Thank you.